Okay, this is Physics 1A for Monday, April 27th. Our SI coach, Jose, is going to have something to say with, to you guys right now. So, go ahead, Jose. Okay, thanks, man. Yep. You got it. Okay, so today what we're going to be talking about is more stuff about rotation. Um, last time we developed the ideas of angular speed and angular acceleration. Today we're going to be talking extensively about moment of inertia. Moment of inertia is a topic that shows up in certainly any physics course you've had before this. You would have talked about this. And probably at some point during your physics class, and you might not remember this, but you probably saw some kind of a, uh, a table or a chart like this. And it tells you moments of inertia for different objects. Maybe you don't remember what moment of inertia is, but you probably remember seeing something like this. Maybe on an exam or uh, maybe in your textbook, right? Okay, so one of the things you don't learn in Physics 2A is where all these things come from. Okay, and that's one of the things that we're going to do today. Uh, and you may not really remember what moment of inertia is or why we even need to understand it, but just in general, I'll tell you what it is right now, and then hopefully by the end of the class, you'll, you'll understand this. So, moment of inertia is uh, the resistance that an object has to being rotated. It's pretty much what it is. It's the resistance to rotation. In the same sense that mass is resistance to linear motion. Right, if you think about it, mass, massive objects, the bigger they are, the harder they are to push, right? I think you guys can all agree that a, uh, a boulder is much harder to push around than a ping pong ball. And the reason why is because the boulder is, you could say much heavier, but more appropriately is because it's more massive. It's its mass that makes it difficult to accelerate, right? Moment of inertia tells you how difficult it is to spin something, to rotate something. And that's it. Hope that makes sense to you guys. But what you should be thinking for yourself as we go through today's lecture is, what is moment of inertia? Unfortunately, I don't have anything specifically to show you with it, but I will have at least one thing you can probably do while you're sitting there at your desk um, or looking at your computer. Okay, so let's get started. This is the set of topics that we're going to be discussing. Um, the first thing we need to talk about is rotational kinetic energy. 
and from there we will get what moment of inertia is out of that and we'll go from there in developing moment of inertia for different objects so the first thing we'll do whoops Look down okay first thing we'll do is find the moment of inertia for a uniform rod and then a cylinder we'll talk about the parallel axis theorem and then if we get enough time we'll talk about this but i don't think we will this will probably be the last topic parallel axis theorem. all of this stuff is about moment of inertia every single bit of it it's a pretty comp complicated topic but it's extremely important in physics so rotational kinetic energy that's the first topic So I have this picture right here that I pulled from a textbook. Um, and it's a picture of an object that is rotating about this axis right here. It's free to rotate about that, that axis. It's The object is this little bean-shaped thing, OK? It's kind of flat and thin, right? You can see that it has some height right here. Um, and it's got mass distributed throughout it in some way that isn't specified, but um, what we're going to do is say, suppose that this object is rotating, and it's rotating with an angular speed omega, right? Just to remind you, the symbol omega, which is uh, the last letter of the Greek alphabet, stands for angular speed or angular velocity. Wait, for some reason this feels weird writing on this today, I don't know why. Um, so the omega means angular speed. And we have this object, and it's rotating around in a circle. Now, something that I failed to mention to you guys yesterday, but it's worth, worth mentioning, is that this quantity is the same for all points on the object. Does that make sense? Like, if I was to choose a point down here, and I was to choose another point over here, and I was to ask, as this entire object rotates, what's the angular pos uh, speed of this one compared to this one? The answer is they'd be the same. The whole object, so any rigid object, that's the way I'm sitting. It's making it hard to write here. So any uh, rigid object um, I should say for, well, any rigid object, all points have the same angular speed. I don't know if that's obvious to you guys, but I will say something to mention why that would be the case. If I pick a point on here, and I think about what happens as it goes around in a circle like this, right, and completes one revolution, the angular speed is effectively the time that it takes, or it's the rate at which that happens, right? The number of turns per second. It can be measured in revolutions per minute. So just to take a really simple value for this, suppose that I tell you that the angular speed is 1 RPM. Technically, this is frequency. Not super important. It's just easier to think about. One revolution per minute, OK? <clears throat> this point right here would go around one time in a minute, right? This point right here would go around one time in a minute. It would just trace out a smaller circle, right? This one would also go around one time in a minute, but would trace out a smaller circle. So the whole object has the same angular speed. Does that make sense? Does, I hope that makes sense to everybody. Do I need to say the same word? Does it say Z or X? That says Z. That's the Z axis right there. Yeah. Whole objects, all points have the exact same angular speed. Now, each point, however, will have a different velocity, right? So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to pick some points on this object here, like one point like right here, one point over here. And I'm going to label this point right here. I'm going to say it has a mass that we're going to call M1. And I'm going to say this object over here has a mass that we're going to call M2. At a moment in time, while the object is rotating, each of these points is going to have a tangential velocity. And one of them has already been drawn here, right? What about different direction? Ko, what do you mean? Sorry, I, I'll stop for a second.
the velocity at each point has a different direction. Yeah, that's right. Like one of them up here might be having a velocity that goes this way. This one would have a velocity that would be kind of, you know, pointing this way probably. They're vectors. So um, each point does not have the same tangential velocity. Each point has different tangential velocities, right? The velocity is going to point tangent to the path that the object's traveling along. And yeah. So we take our object and we break it up into a bunch of tiny little masses. M1, M2, M3, and so on and so forth, right? And then we say that before we had defined that kinetic energy for an object that has velocity v is given as basically one half the mass of the object, so like m1, for example, times v1 squared. And then we'd add to that the kinetic energy of every other point on the object. If we wanted to get the total kinetic energy of the object, this would give us the total kinetic energy. 1 half m1 v1 squared plus 1 half m2 uh, v2 squared, and then plus dot dot dot, up until we've accounted for every single point on the object. That would give us the total kinetic energy of this object that's rotating, right? So we can write that expression uh, like this. The kinetic energy is effectively just a sum, or one half of the sum, of mi vi squared. And that sum runs over the entire object. But there's a relationship between this common angular speed omega, the velocity vi, and the distance to each point, right? So now, if I actually draw out the, the distance to each of my points right here, and I label that one R2, ooh, that looks awful, sorry. If I label this one, okay, gotta figure out why I'm writing so sloppily today. R, I'll write it down here, R2. I don't know if I can draw this line on here very well, but then I draw a line out to this one, and I call that one, it's not gonna look very good, so I'm not gonna draw, we call that one R1 then we can put down this relationship. V1 is going to be equal to R1 multiplied by omega, and V2 is going to be equal to R2 multiplied by omega. Or in general, what I have then is going to be 1 half sum over, now I've replaced the V here with these expressions, so it's going to be now the sum over Mi, and instead of writing Vi, I can now write R sub I times omega, and then that's squared. And then I can kind of reorganize this a little bit here. So it's going to be 1 half the sum over mi ri squared. And then omega is really not part of the sum because it's the same for every object. So just like the 1 half that I could pull out of the sum, we can also pull the omega squared out of the sum as well. So we get that. That's what we get. And then we just say, okay, well this thing right here we're going to call that moment of inertia it's defined as the sum over each mass on the object multiplied by the distance to the axis squared and this is what we call moment of inertia use the symbol capital I, and it's given by the sum over mi, that's every mass of the object, times ri, and I'll say right here that r sub i represents the perpendicular distance to the axis of rotation, okay? Perpendicular distance to the axis of rotation is what the r sub i represents. That's mode of inertia. Now, 
once we have this definition right here, we can make a larger statement about what rotational kinetic energy is. Now that we know what uh, this thing called moment inertia is defined as, we can define rotational kinetic energy as just one half the moment of inertia of the object multiplied by omega squared. That's your rotational kinetic energy. One half I omega squared. If you compare that to this, you'll notice that the I in this thing plays the role of mass. Omega plays the role of velocity. Now, if you compare this to, it looks very similar to, to regular kinetic energy. It's just that you've basically interchanged mass for moment of inertia. And moment of inertia describes, once again, how hard it is to rotate something. How hard it is to rotate something. Objects with a large moment of inertia are going to be very difficult to rotate. What's an example of something like that? So let's use tennis rackets. Um, anytime you, you swing a tennis racket, you're swinging it in a kind of rotational motion. Would you guys agree with that statement? You, you, you extend your arm with a tennis racket and you swing it in a circular motion, right? Okay. If the tennis racket has a large rotational inertia, it's going to be harder for you to do that than if it has a small rotational inertia. How would a tennis racket have a large rotational inertia? Well, one way is if there was a lot of weight in the tip. I remember when I was like a kid and I played, I played tennis, but I had a tennis racket and you know it's shaped like a tennis racket, right? You've got your, your strings and stuff in here, right? If there's a lot of extra mass up here at the top, and in particular, this, this tennis racket was designed with like a lot of extra mass in the tip, it makes it harder to rotate. But once it is rotating, it has more energy than it would have if it didn't have all that mass at the end, okay? So this would be a way that by putting a mass on it, it's gonna be harder to rotate. I mentioned this because I had a student once that uh, actually um, designed tennis rackets, and he told me that one of the most important things in terms of the way that a tennis racket works for someone is what its moment of inertia is. <laughs> I was really surprised to find that out. They measure moment of inertia, by the way, in units wise, in kilograms times meters squared, or gram centimeters squared sometimes is what I've seen, but this would be the SI unit, it's kilogram times meters squared. Okay. All right. So that's what rotational kinetic energy is. We've defined mathematically what moment of inertia is, but this is not going to be very useful unless we look at some applications, right? So um, I've got one problem right here, very simple problem where we can talk about that. But before we do, actually, let me just stop for a second on this slide, so to speak, and ask you guys, are there any questions you guys have about this in general so far? Okay. Okay. So let's look at a simple problem for calculation of moment inertia. Two identical masses, M, sorry about that. Two identical masses, M, each, are separated by a light rigid rod of length 2L, find the rotational inertia about an axis at the center of the rod and then at one end of the rod. So very simple object. I can use shapes for this, I think, pretty safely. Um, we've got a, a line, right? Just a long, thin line. And it has a length that says 2L. And then at each end, you've got a circle, okay? And, just put one right there. Um, put one right there. And let's say that this 2L is the distance to the centers of these objects. Okay. So that's 2L all the way to the center of mass of each of my objects here. Okay. Each one of these guys has a mass that we call M. So that's M and that's M. And then we're not going to worry about the rod because it says that it's a light rigid rod. So we're going to assume that it has negligible contribution to the moment of inertia, even though um, it would contribute a little bit. Now, we first want to find the moment of inertia of this object about the center of the rod and then one end of the rod. Okay, so we'll start off at the center for part A. Objects have different rotational inertias about different points. I'm going to have you guys do a little like quick activity at your desk to, to verify that for yourselves. 
Um, so, what's the moment of inertia of this object? Well, our definition is that we find moment of inertia by summing over each mass in my system, and then I multiply by the distance that each of those masses is to the center, or well, it's really, it's to the, to the axis of rotation, right? That's what I said all right. So in this case, that would be, well, I've got one mass right here, and it's a distance L, right, to the center, axis of rotation. I should be really clear here that this, in case you're turning away from your computer for a second or something, this is the axis of rotation for part A. You're trying to rotate this system around its center. Oops, axis of rotation. Oh my god. So, uh, okay. Axis. One more. There we go. Rotation. So, we take this mass, multiply by that distance, that's L squared, right? Plus the other mass, times L squared. Okay, so we get that the moment of inertia, about the center at least, is going to be 2 in L squared. You guys have any questions about that? Give me a second. I'm going to sneeze. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> for part B, we now want to find the mode of inertia about one end. So this is part B. Now we take our mode of inertia, and we say it's equal to, okay, let's start with this one, m. m is a distance of 2l away from the new moment, the new axis. So it's going to be m times 2l squared. Uh, plus, I need to multiply by the other mass and its distance to the axis, and that's going to be 0. Okay. So this is going to give me uh, 4, right? 4 ml squared. Will look right to you guys? This would be the moment of inertia about one of the ends. So this implies that it's twice as difficult to rotate this object about one end as it is to rotate it about the center. And that probably isn't too surprising to you, because if you take any object and you try to rotate it about its center of mass, because after all, in this system with equal masses, that's that, that middle point right there, the center, is the, is the center of mass, right? If you try to rotate an object about the point where it's balanced, it's generally very easy, right? What you can do to verify this for yourself is if you take your pen or your pencil, whatever you, like, writing instrument you have in front of me, in front of you, and you put that between, like, your fingers, and you try to wiggle it, um, if you put the pencil, like, right, if you're, if you're wiggling it so that you're trying to rotate the pencil, like, right in the uh, center, and you get a feel for how hard that is, and then you take the same pencil and you put it between your fingers and you try to rotate it about the end, you should see that it's a little bit more difficult to wiggle it back and forth. Is what I'm describing makes sense to you guys. You take a pencil, right? You 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 know you hold it between your fingers, or you put it between your fingers, and you try to you try to wiggle it by by holding it like right here. You put fingers on both sides of this, right? And then you just try to rotate it this way and back, like back and forth. So you guys see what I mean? See what I mean? So you hold it in the middle, and then you just like wiggle it back and forth, and then you do the same thing at the end. So you just like put it right between maybe the ends of your thumb and your finger, and then you try to rotate it that way. It's harder about one end, right? Would you guys agree? There's an axis that you could rotate it around that's even easier. If you take the pencil and you put it between your fingers, between your palms of your hands, and just like roll it, like you would if you were, I don't know, rolling like dough out or something like that, it's even easier to rotate it like that. Would you guys agree? If you try to rotate it through the long axis, right? So basically, if you've got your pencil and you wanted to rank it, an axis that goes basically this way through your pencil, if you try to roll it, right, roll it on the table even, right? That's the easiest one, right? You guys agree? That's the easiest way to, I mean, not, I'm, what I'm trying to say here. There's the least resistance to the uh, effort. Eff <laughs> My words are failing me today. <laughs> there's the least resistance to spinning about this axis, and there's the most resistance to spinning when you try to spin it about this axis here, right? That's mode of inertia. That's what it is. It's how hard you rotate things, right? I hope that clarified for you guys what it is. Or... Do you guys have any questions? All right, cool. So um, let's do a calculation uh, where we have some numbers too. 
and this is just a little more, a little bit more um, advanced. That's this one right here. Moments of inertia for different rotation axes. So this is from your textbook. It's example 9.6. Uh, a machine part consists of three discs linked by lightweight struts. This is our picture. You've got a disc here, a disc here, and a disc here. You can see what their masses are. You can also see the distances. This is 0 0.5, 0 0.4, and 0 0.3, so it's like a 3, 4, 5 triangle. <clears throat> Just like basically all of the examples in this book. Um, what is the body's moment of inertia about an axis 1 through the center of disk A? What is the moment of inertia about axis 2? And what is the body's kinetic energy if it rotates about axis 1, blah, blah, blah? Okay. So our goal first is to find the moment of inertia through axis 1, which is right here. We'll call it I1. Now, this moment of inertia is perpendicular to the plane of the figure, okay? So it comes out of the core. And to figure out what the moment of inertia about that point is, we would take the sum over each object, oops, mi, ri squared, okay? So that's gonna be one half, we've got mass A, the distance of mass A to the axis, what's that equal to? What is going to go right here for uh, for mass A? Zero, that's right. So this is going to be zero. One half MB. This distance here is the distance from the axis to B. So that's 0.5. And then MC is the distance from here to here, so that's gonna be 0.4. And then we just plug numbers in. All right, MA is 0.3. No, we don't have to put that one in. Uh, MB is 0.1. And then MC is 0.2. You guys want to tell me what that is? Oh, did I make a mistake? Uh, is, sorry, the, the way I wrote this is kind of confusing here. Let me... Let me just do something real quick. Let me just do this. Yeah. That term was zero. Right? What am I doing? Why is there a half there? Oh my god, I'm sorry. There is no half. You're right. I didn't make that mistake before, did I? No, yeah, you're right. It's the definition of moment of inertia. It does not have a half. You're absolutely right. I am so sorry about that. Here, we'll just delete it. Boom, it's gone. And we'll do it there. <laughs> sorry about that, guys. Yeah, there is no one half. That's absolutely right. Can I get this one? Good point. Sorry about that. Point zero four four five. Okay. You guys agree? Oh, two different answers. All right, you already do the answer to part B. Those answers sound right to me. Let's see what I get. Well, oh, I gotcha. So 0 0.057. This is that big one. Let's see. Yeah, I agree.
Okay. So that's uh, that's our moment of inertia for part A. Any questions about that? Um, part two says we need to uh, find the moment of inertia about this axis here. So now it's rotating in a circle, but it's rotating um, like that, kind of up towards you. Yeah, the half was for rotational kinetic energy. That's correct view. I don't know why I threw it in there. It's my bad. So about axis two, you basically see that B and C are already on the axis, right? So they're not going to contribute anything. So the entire um, mode of inertia is just going to be MA times the distance. So here's the question. Do I use this distance here, or do I use this distance here for part B? Which of those two distances am I going to use? Am I going to use 0.5, or am I going to use 0.4? Yeah, and why is that? It's because it's the, the shortest perpendicular distance to the axis. Okay. You can define any distance you want to the axis, right? Any of these would be distances to the axis. The shortest perpendicular distance is um, 0.4. And then MA was uh, 0.3, so 0 0.3 kg, um, 0 0.4 meters. Squared. And then we just packed it with this is equal to. I got. Same answer you guys got. Okay. Part C says, what is the body's kinetic energy if it rotates about axis one with angular speed omega equal to four radians per second? All right, so then we can use our definition that kinetic energy is equal to <coughs> one half. In this case, it's gonna be I1 times omega squared. So that's one half. Uh, I1 is that number right there. And then omega, we're saying is 4 radians per second. We're squaring that. And I got 0.456. Now let's look at the units of this, but do you guys agree? 0.456? Uh, it's the axis through A, Danielle. Uh, axis 1, so that's this one right here. So it's the, the axis that's going through A or through the page. You keep typing and then um, the units on this become kg uh, meters squared over seconds squared but there's also this radian squared that's sticking around the other units kilogram meter squared per second squared that's a joule so you can replace that with joule and then you, you basically just you ignore this you just ignore the radian radian isn't really a unit I mean it is but it isn't it's, it's a ratio, so there's no, like, dimensions to it, if that makes any sense. It's a ratio of arc length divided by radius, which is a distance divided by a distance, so it's, it's not really a unit. Okay. There we go. That's uh, a couple simple moment of inertia calculations, as well as a uh, kinetic energy calculation. Anyone have any questions? Okay. Now we're going to do the hard stuff. The 
first one is not that hard, but it's going to get really hard. So, uh, you know, uh, if, if you really want to understand anything about moment inertia, what we're going to do for the next little bit in class, in the next hour or so, it's going to be very challenging. Like, we're going to do some mathematics that are going to be, like, you've seen them before, and you're going to understand them, but it's going to be really hard to do on your own, okay? So, uh, the next thing we want to talk about is moment of inertia. Moment of inertia for uniform objects. That's what we're going to talk about next. The way we do this, <coughs> uniform object could be like a ruler or it could be a bowling ball. This is basically just the mode of inertia for objects in general. Okay, Objects that cannot be broken down and turned into a sum like we just did here. For those type of objects, the inner, or sorry, the, uh, the moment of inertia is going to be defined like this. Um, it's going to be defined as the integral of r squared dm. And I don't even know how to describe what this integral is without actually doing a calculation of it to show you how it works. That makes sense. But I'll tell you now what it is. To use the mode of inertia for a uniform object, you have to split the object up into a bunch of slices that we call dm. Okay, And dm is going to be a, a, a small slice of the object. And I'm also going to tell you that we have this relationship that um, what about the object is uniform? That's a good question. Uh, uniform, Uniformly distributed mass. We're also going to talk about non-uniform distributions too, so I really should have just said objects, but that makes it uniform mass distribution. DM is a small slice of the object. And then the, another thing we need for this is density. So this symbol is what we use for density. It's a, like, it looks like a P, but it's, it's, a, it's a row. And since density is equal to the mass of an object divided by its volume, this thing DM, we're going to say, is going to be equal to rho dB. You can also write this like this. Mass is equal to rho times volume. And then if you take the derivative of that, you get this. This is what was on our homework to prove. There is a proof on your homework about this. That's right, yeah, exactly. Not the one that's due, not the circular motion one, but the next one, I believe, right? So we have to use an integral now. And these are the kind of pieces that we need to know uh, to, to solve for it. Yesterday's? Was there a homework due yesterday? You sure it wasn't center, center of mass? You sure it wasn't center of mass? A lot of people typing. So, the momentum homework, but the problem was about finding center of mass, not about finding mode of inertia. Yeah, send it. Kind of similar, but not with inertia. Thank you, Bell. Exactly, right? It's, it's definitely similar, for sure. For sure. Yes. Okay. So, how do we do this? What's an example? So the first thing we're going to look at is a uniform rod. Okay, so let's take a shape, make a rod, and then let's also take a shape and let's see if we can get an axis. How do these axes draw digital like that? Okay, so let's make it black. Oh, then it takes a piece of shape, axis. There we go. <laughs> of course, the only snaps to the. That's fine, we can, we can just do like this. The axis doesn't have to be around right the object. Oh, there it goes. Stop snapping. Cool. So let's say that this is the x direction. And this is the y direction. And we're going to do a uniform rod. Oh, I realize there's something else I have to do with this picture. I have to show you the thickness of the rod. Oh, I better put the thing on after. 
have done. Let's see, here's what we're gonna do. Copy paste. I don't know the part that's behind, right? This part. Oh, whoops. There's my rod. And one more thing. Just like this. Okay, I don't know what I did last time that made it uh, stop snapping. I really would love to figure that out. That's okay. We'll just have the axis go like this, I suppose. Ooh, it fixed. I really have no idea what I just did there. All right, here's the x-axis. This is the y-axis. And we've got our long uniform rod. And what we're going to do is, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to find the moment of inertia about the left end. we have to do to do this is we need to carry out this integral. How do we carry out this integral? What we have to do is we have to break our object up into tiny pieces, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a slice of my object here. So I'm, I'm cutting a slice out right here of my object. And we're going to say that the slice that we're going to cut out here, okay, it's going to be this little cube, right? And what I'm going to say is that that slice contains a mass that we call dm. All right, it's just mass, and so the fact that I'm putting a d in front of it, I hope that doesn't uh, bother you too much. But the little d represents that it's like a infinitesimal portion of my object. Okay. Um, let's mention some other uh, statements about this object. Um, so it has some dimensions. Uh, one dimension is going to be the length in this direction here. There's also a dimension here that we're going to call the height of the thing, and there's a dimension here that we're going to call t. Yeah, that looks bad if I print this around. So h is the height, and t is the thickness, and l is the length of my object. Okay. We break it up into tiny pieces that we call dm. Okay. And I'm also going to say that um, the thickness of my slice that I cut out here, the thickness of this slice here in this direction, I'm going to say is going to be dx. And I'm going to define the distance out to that point to be just x, right? So this is the x-coordinate of this point. Of course, we're just going to call that x. Oops. That's just the x-coordinate in general of my point. OK? I think we have everything we need here. So I've, I've got my, my uniform rod. I've broken it up into a piece that I call dm. The next thing that I need to state is what is the volume of that piece, OK? So dm is the mass. This seems like area under the curve. Yeah, it's somewhere to area under the curve. That's right. Uh, this is the mass of the slice. And now I also want to talk about the volume of the slice, OK? The slice itself is going to have a volume that we're going to call dv. Oops, sorry about that. It's going to have a, a, a volume that we're going to call dv. So that is the volume of the slice. And then we can actually say what the volume of the slice is, right? OK, before we do that, let's, let's, let's write this down. What's the volume of the entire object? 
What's the volume of the entire object? XTH, that's right. Exactly. The volume is going to be, and we'll use V for this, the volume is equal to, uh, what is it? Uh, L times T times H. The length times the thickness times the height, because it's like a parallel pipe or a rectangular prism. Okay. What's the volume of DV? What's the volume of DV? What's the volume of my slice right here? Well, the slice has a thickness dx, and then it has the same other dimensions, t and h, right? Yeah, t, h, dx, exactly. That's the volume of the slice, okay. What's rho? Well, rho is density, right? So in this particular case, let me tell you that the total mass is m. So the mass of my object, we're just going to say is m. That's, that's the total mass of the object. Um, and the uh, the density then would be mass divided by the volume, but the volume is right there, so it's mass divided by L times T times the height. So now I'm ready to actually use this equation. That dm, the mass of my slice, must be equal to the density times the volume of my slice. Hopefully that makes some logical sense to you. The mass of the slice is equal to its density times its volume, that's all I'm saying, right? So then we're capable of putting that all together now, right? So we say, okay, now dm now, is equal to rho, which is m over LTH, times dv, which is right above there, right? It's dx times t times h. So dm now is equal to just m divided by L dx. That is what dm is now. This is actually how we're going to do all these problems. We're going to figure this out first. And then we're going to go through and do the calculations. Notice that we have to use an integral, but we don't start with the integral. Does that make sense? You start with this. You figure out what this thing is. Because what, I mean, you, you can tell this integral is weird, right? I, I hope that this integral looks weird to you because it should. Um, the integral states we're going to evaluate something over r squared, but then the, the variable of integration is going to be m. And that's weird, right? That's really weird. Because it's like normally you'd see x squared dx, right? Or y squared dy or something. But this is r squared and then a different variable. So you can't even do the integral until you figure out what this thing is. you got to figure out what dm is, and, and you figure it out by doing what we just did. You cut a slice, you say, this is the mass, this is the volume. I didn't mean to, yeah. This is the mass, this is the volume. And then you work out what those things are until you get to this. Until you get to, like, a dx, a dr, or a dy right here, basically. All right? And now we'll do the integral. The integral will be very easy. But, yeah. So... Moment of inertia. Oops. Moment of inertia is going to be equal to the integral of r squared dm. But in this case, r, right? r is the distance, okay, from our axis. And now I'll, I'll, I'll reiterate what the axis is now that we have to, This is our axis of rotation over here, okay? The object is rotating about this end. Okay, this is the axis. The axis goes up, and it's basically the right y-axis. That's what it's rotating about. So this is the rotational axis going up and down through the end, right? So r is the distance from the axis to the slice, which is x, right? So the r is just going to become x. So this is going to be the integral of x squared dm, but dm is m over l dx. That's it, right? So, mass and length are constant. We're going to integrate from 0 up to L. The limits of integration are always going to be from your axis or from one end of your object to the other. But one thing I should say, at least with these kind of problems, is that um, you need to put the axis at the origin. So axis and origin have to be the same, basically. Anyway, 0 to L, x squared, m over L dx. This is an easy integral, right? It's going to be m over L. Those are constants, the mass of the object. Oops. And then the integral of x squared dx, that's going to be 1 over 3 x cubed. 
we evaluate that from zero to L. So we end up getting that the moment of inertia of the rod about the end is equal to one third. Uh, oh, there's one more step, isn't there? It's gonna be one third, here, I'll put the step right here. So this is gonna be M over L, and then it's gonna be L cubed over three. And so our final answer is gonna be one third M L squared. That's the moment of inertia of a rod about the end. One of the L cubes cancels with the L right here. Does that make sense to you guys? This is the type of um, integration technique that you're going to have to be using to solve for moment of inertia. Yeah, let's go back and look at the table and see if we got it right. I mean, I know we got it right because I've obviously done this a bunch of times, but... Whoop! Where did it go? All right, we'll just go right here. Uh, long, thin rod with rotation through center. That's not what we want, right? We want this one. Long, thin rod, rotation, axis through end, one third ml squared. Yep, that's how the table is derived. And we're going to drive the top three right here. We don't really need to drive the rectangular plate. It's, uh, I hope it's self-explanatory. But we're going to drive all these, basically, today. The, the cylinder is a lot harder than the, than the, um, than the, the long, thin rod. But uh, there you go. Just from doing uh, this little integral right here, you figure out where that one third comes from. It comes from integrating x squared dx, basically, right? We're going to do one more real quick because it, it's easy to fit it in, but I'm going I'm to reiterate what we did here. Okay, Our equation, we didn't even write our equation down and start using it until we had already figured out what the equation meant. That meant we had to figure out what dm was. dm is almost always going to be defined something like this as a density times dv. And density in this case was this, and we just put that together with our definition of what volume was. And then we defined the volume of a piece, dv. And then from there, we were able to figure out what dm was equal to. And it turned out that dm was just dx times m over l. And there you go. You guys have any questions about all this stuff? I think that's pretty neat. So let's do the other one. Um, what if we change the problem so that the axis was right at the center of the rod? All right? And then we remember what I just said right here. Let's do a part B. If I put the axis at the center, okay, everything that I've stated so far is still true right? But with the axis at the center, there's only one thing that's going to change, and that's going to be the limits, because the axis has to be at the origin, right? So if I put my axis to go through here, that becomes x equal to 0, and the end of the rod becomes x equal to L over 2, and the other end of the rod becomes x equal to negative L over 2, right? So now my integral I'm going to call this the moment of inertia about the center of mass, is going to be equal to um, the integral. We'll pull the m over l out. We're doing the exact same integration, but now we're going to go from negative l over 2 to l over 2 of x squared dx. So that's going to end up being m over l. Again, x cubed, uh, but we have to evaluate between these limits here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say it's going to be one-third of L over 2 cubed um, minus negative L over 2 cubed. And this is going to end up being equal to 1 over 8 plus 1 over 8. Why don't I just not skip steps? So there's a one-third. We're multiplying by uh, L cubed over 8 minus negative L cubed over 8. And that's going to be what? Um, can you just double with limits from 0 to L over 2? Yes. Yes. You definitely can do that, yeah. I think so. 
Yes. That sounds like that will work. I center mass then is going to end up being equal to, you can work out how this works, but a 1 over 8 plus 1 over 8 is a quarter, so you end up getting 1 over 12. That is the moment of inertia about the center of mass, 1 over 12. And yeah, but just to reiterate, I'm pretty sure what you said there would work. Yeah. Um, so just by changing the limits, right, that's all we did. The limits here were from negative L over 2 to L over 2. The limits here are from 0 to L. Get different answers. That's it. That's mode of inertia. Not only is this technique that we just described useful in this course, in Physics 1C, this is like the first month. The first month of Physics 1C is doing integrals like this. And then, like, the third month is as well. So, yeah. This technique, while it uses integration, and I know that some of you may be simultaneously taking 190 with this class, so you, you might not be super familiar with integrals yet. Um, it's kind of more preparation for 1C, if that makes any sense. Oh, he went there. Where did I go? We're taking a break now, too. You gotta pay attention, Jake. Well, you know, 